I'm a feminist, but I really resent this constant refrain that we're not all men hating. Back in my day, we used to hate men all the time, and it was wonderful. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a Listen, joke. G- g- gentlemen, if you have come here to be with us t- this evening in commune... Uh, get a line. Sarah, no. <laughs> Sarah Keyworth sorry, doesn't just... mean you. She doesn't mean you. I'm joking, I'm joking. It's very nice to yes, have you. Yes, We need men in the fight. Thank Absolutely. you for being here. It's we very, love you. It's very good to see you all. <laughs> Woo, men! Woo, men! Woo, men! Woman! <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, it's it raining makes, you. It makes them laugh, so... Um. Um. I'm a feminist, but if a feminist genie came down and offered me three wishes, one of them would definitely be the invention of tights that didn't roll down. Like, all night like this. I mean, I know this is the most pressing feminist issue, but, like, it's here. And I know these... I put them on, I was like, these are too low, these aren't going to work, but I didn't have time to find any others, and I was running out the flat. I thought, it'll be fine. I'll stretch them out on the way. Look. This is where they are. Oh, there they are there, yeah. So if the feminist genie comes, that's what I'm asking for. I'm fucking asking that's for That's a perfectly it. reasonable question. I don't think that's anti-feminist. It's not anti-feminist. It's just there are things that are more pressing that other people would be very upset if I... Nah. You can't put tights above Afghanistan. <laughs> no. Can't we? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you're right. You do one. You're right. Uh, I'm a feminist, but my girlfriend and I have matching pink and blue mugs, and if she ever used my blue one, I would call her a lesbian. <laughs> Wow. I said that to her before I left and she laughed, so you can't be mad. (laughs) Wow. That's just so good and it really does stand on its own. Um, (laughs) I'm a feminist, but boot-cut jeans are back and that's because I had a visit from the feminist genie. Ah. I I, I did a wish. Um, They flatter my figure so much better and they've been out for so long and all of these, like tight skinny jeans that have been around for so long and then they relaxed a bit but boot cuts really do they they do flatter my figure and i was so excited tonight because the guest's daughter was in the green room evie evie shout Shout out out to evie and i was like oh my god i heard the rumors they were back but they really are back because she's young and she was standing in the green room just with full out no idea they'd ever been back here before What? She didn't know that they were coming back. She just thought they were here. That's how young she I would is. I think, yeah, yeah. I mean, but, but she must know. She's young. She must know that these are new. She did seem smart. It, it, she's, in fully, she's fully in boot cuts. Boot cuts are back. I'm telling mm. you, spread the word. So excited. But I need enough people to be wearing them. This is a real I'm a feminist, but so that I don't look like I don't know they went out of fashion. Like, I, yeah, that's I true. need people, I need the young people, I need the 18-year-olds, I need your 19-year-olds, I need your 20-year-olds, I need your 21-year-olds, you need I need them you TikTok. wearing them, I yeah. need you, I need the boots, uh, boot jeans on TikTok and I need them now. Are you wearing some? Oh, sorry, you wanted me to keep going. I no, need the 25-year-olds. you're year past olds. it. That's the message of the podcast. Listen, listen, listen. You are, you, I will take 25. Are any of you wearing them though? No, well, you can't help me then. <laughs> Don't, this is false advertising. You will go out, you'll get some. You'll stop walking around town in them. You're dropping into conversation. I'm 25 and I'm wearing these boot cut jeans. <laughs> Casually, at bus stops, so that when I wear them, it looks like, yeah, of course she should be wearing them. They're super in fashion. Can she we get... hasn't held onto them since 1998. Can we get Guilty Feminist branded bootcut jeans? Yes. That say, I'm a feminist, but... On the butt. Yes. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but on the butt. On the butt, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I'm a feminist, but I do like pinching feminist butts. <laughs> Consensually. That's just wordplay, isn't it, really? Yeah, it really is. Yeah, there's no denying that's wordplay. Do you? Though? I really backed down from the delivery as well. I thought yeah. you really have really, sold it. I really knew. They didn't know whether they could laugh or not because you felt ashamed of that I joke. Went, I'm sorry. You're Sarah Keyworth is a feminist, but she was ashamed of her own "I'm a feminist" butt joke. I am. Um, so didn't sell it with authority, I which didn't. is tonight's theme. Exactly. Oh, what a link! I mean, 
I'm I think a professional. I did it on I've been doing this for some time now. Yeah, it's yeah, great. It's an extraordinary mm. segue. Live from King's Place in London, the Spotted Shop presents the Guilty Feminists with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Sarah Keyworth, and our very special guest, Mary Ann Seagart, talking about authority. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists, our proxies and insecurities, which you... Ah, oh, man. God. <laughs> How can I mess that up? And our hypocrisies and insecurities, which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White. With me is Sarah Keyworth, and we're talking about authority. <laughs> Woo! Do you feel you're someone with natural authority, Sarah? Absolutely not. I feel... Like, you've got a quiet authority about you, which you undermine slightly for comedic purposes, because in stand-up, often you self-deprecate to get a laugh. Mm. But I think the mm-hmm. very fact you're doing stand-up comedy in the first place means you take control of the room. So that's why you can afford to kind of go, oh, I look like I'm dressed for sixth form. You know, you can kind of, not that wasn't a good impersonation, if that sounds like I'm impersonating you. You know, you can kind of go, oh, lol, look at me. But in fact, you're kind of owning the room. Did you have to learn to own the room for stand-up? Um, I think I've always been able to goon the room. <laughs> I'm very, I can be very silly. I'm, a, I'm, I'm very much a natural follower, though. In I'm, life? Yes. It's interesting because I will arrive at a gig, tell the person on the door, bless you. I will <laughs> arrive at a gig, tell the person on the door that I'm an act, and they'll go, Really? Really? And then, yeah. And then I'll come in and I'll do the show and they'll go, you were like a completely different person. And I'll go, that's because I, you know, I'm not obnoxious all day, every day. You're not obnoxious when you're doing stand-up comedy. You're yeah, very Can you charming. imagine if I did that when I arrived everywhere? Some comedians do. I know. And they're awful. Yes, they are. They are awful. The kind of comedians that turn up and, hey, 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 and they can't turn it off. Yeah. And in the car, they're all, sometimes they spar for who can be the funniest in the car. And it's like, Mm -hmm. it's a a lot exhausting. It's so exhausting. I once went to the doctors and the doctor asked what I did for a living. And I said, oh, I'm a comedian. And the doctor went, really? Because you you don't seem very funny. (laughs) That's the the great Green Bowling story, isn't it? I'm asking for sertraline. (laughs) That's that's literally the... (laughs) We're going to come in like... <laughs> That's literally the story of is it the gate the great Grimboli? You know when the the is it Grimboli? There's a story about the most famous clown, the great Grimboli, makes everybody laugh. And one day this sad man comes into the doctor and says, uh, I'm very sad, very depressed, doctor, can you help me? And he says, Do you know what I'm gonna prescribe you? A ticket to see the great Grimboli because that will make you laugh. And he says famously, but doctor, I am the great Grimboli. Oh my God. Yeah. And that, wow, I am. that story is so old, it's new again. Yeah. I have probably got his name wrong. It's Gamboli or Grimboli or something like that. But they, uh, yeah, you no, they are did just give that. me Sertraline. They didn't give me a ticket to my show. <laughs> but doctor, I am the great Sarah Keyworth. Yeah. That's the punchline of that story. Yeah. And if you were they, funny at the doctors, you would have said that. With depression and narcissism. <laughs> At the same ah. time. Um, yeah, on the contrary, when I went to my fertility doctor when I was doing IVF, my way of coping with stressful situations sometimes is to get funny, is to do lots of... So yeah, if something's yeah. potentially sad, I my joke rate, and it's not on purpose, it just goes up, I can't control it. And so I was honestly... If the panel shows saw me riffing... <laughs> Best in, gig of your life. Oh, my yeah. God. Every time I saw my fertility doctor, mm. I'd be zinger, 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 zinger. And he would be laughing so much. And one day he said to me, I wish all my patients were like you because most of them are crying. <sighs> and He's a bad doctor. <laughs> yeah, but like he would say, once he got my age wrong and said, oh, I, I thought you were so much younger, you know, you look so young... And I said, as we walked out the door, and then he gave us terrible news that I was, you know, unlikely to conceive. And as we walked out the door, I said to Tom, well, what I mostly took from that is how young I look. (laughs) And and he was just, he just couldn't Mm. believe it. And one time, I remember, he hugged me. He was very handsome. And one time he he hugged me, 
goodbye. And he said, let's get you pregnant, like that. Which was... Oh, my God. It was... This is a porno. No, no. It was, it was the yes and spirit. I'd put out there a funny spirit. It didn't feel wrong. Do you know what I mean? You know when something feels wrong? Uh-huh. I'm not reporting. Please oh, don't I know report when him. something feels wrong. Yeah, it felt like he was part... By the way, if you're a doctor, don't do it. But somehow we had such a rapport. You, you know? had, yeah, you had um, a good relationship. So can I, later, not now, ask for the name of your doctor, go to your doctor and see if the... Then tell the doctor I'm a comedian and see what the doctor says to me. So what you've heard is that someone told me I wasn't very funny and you yeah. want to find out whether they find you funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Competitive doctoring, yeah, Absolutely. absolutely. But the thing is, it's not a proper test now because I would go in in order to get a good review. Yeah. And then I'd probably be super unfunny because there's nothing unfunnier than someone trying to be funny. funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it probably would backfire. (laughs) It would, it would. I thought you were going to suggest I asked my doctor to get me pregnant. (laughs) (laughs) Why do you never offer to get me pregnant, doctor? Deborah's doctor does that. Yeah, no, I was... Zing, 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 zing. But I can't control it. Do you know where else that has happened to me is the Cannes Film Festival? Because Clang. people are... No, because honestly, and I say this with all due respect, which is absolutely none, <laughs> the people of the Cannes Film Festival, hashtag not all the people of the Cannes Film Festival, there is a, if you've been, you'll know, there are men on yachts that are going nowhere, they're all moored, and you have to go and meet men on yachts that are moored. They don't, it's such a metaphor for the film industry, just boats that go nowhere. It's, it's everything, nothing's, nothing's ever going to be made. Men on yachts that go nowhere. It's so awful, I men. can't tell you. Oh my God, I've had the worst experiences there. Just with, you're meant to go and sing for your supper and go and pitch your movie and oh, right, do the yeah. jazz hands, and they just sit there and like, be like, be funny. And I remember it very well. This is actually really plays into our theme of authority because they would sit there with all this authority and I'm like, where are you getting this from? Some of them had never made a movie. They were just like an investor. They were like a finance guy who thought he wanted to get into films. But you would have to tell him your story. Like he knew anything about it. And sometimes they were just, I've never met people like that anywhere else in the world, but so unspeakable, just unspeakable. I mean, things that you can't believe. Like a guy would get on the boat and be like this guy died and left us all his money to have a party so we're gonna party like rock stars and we're next to the Colombian yacht so we're gonna be have big straws over to the Colombian yacht like stuff like that that you're just there and, and all of these I things love that men, character for you by the way I mean <laughs> all of these all of these men you're meant to laugh at everything they say and everything they say is just horrible Grim. yeah and so when I was on these yachts and sometimes producers would say like whoever you were developing for would go and talk to these guys and try to get money and stuff like that and I just so the only way I could cope with it was for my joke rate to go up exponentially and it was a stress response so I'd be like budding 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 zing 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 and they all loved me obviously none of them gave me any money to make a film mm. but I went there one year with a writing partner and she said this is like the french court isn't it where everyone has to earn their place so in the French court, there'd be the beauties and the wits. You had to justify. And she turned to me and said, I don't think we're the beauties. <laughs> I think, and not, not that we didn't think we were attractive, but there were women on those yachts that were just like, oh, yeah. the most beautiful women I'd, <laughs> the most beautiful women I've ever seen. But they, were, they weren't wearing clothes. They were wearing like bits of draped in silk that were sort of, the sexiest clothes are not revealing, but they're unstable. So it looks oh, like it's, yeah. it's just might slip off at any moment. Oh, it's come back. Oh, she, and just sort mm. of someone who would just keep sliding a bit of silk up her sleeve. Knocked off on a strong wind or something like yes, that. Yes, yeah. but it could all fall off at any minute. So everyone was mesmerized. And these women were a kind of beauty I'd never seen. Mm. And they didn't say anything. They were just there to be beautiful and draped in silk. My writing partner and I are perfectly attractive in London. Like, we don't feel, you know, we're... But there, mm. it was like... Yada, yada, da, 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 And the last time I came back from Cannes, I stayed home for three days crying. I didn't want to see anyone. It was like my oh, own personal no. lockdown. It was way before, way before. But I just cried for three days. It was like Dante's... Like, if Dante had, had one last level of hell we hadn't heard about... Um, <laughs> I was, I'd been in it for days. And like, you had to put on pretty dresses every night. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember going to one of these yacht parties 
in this pretty dress and somebody saying, oh, you look dressed up. Have you got a party to go to? And I was like, I'm literally standing on a yachting camp with a glass of champagne. But that's how they think there's always got to be another party. Uh You know, there's somewhere else better that you should be. And things like that that just, you know, oh, God, awful things. Like someone, a young composer we were with, trying to get into this horrible party. It was like a nightclub. Mm -hmm. And everyone was absolutely off their tits smashed. And someone was meant to put his name on the door and hadn't. And he was screaming. He was standing at the door going, I know him, I know him. And he was screaming, Barry, Barry, and like waving. And Barry There's couldn't no see him. There's dignity in yelling Barry. Is there? <laughs> it was so terrible. And my friend and I were just looking at him like, why do you want to be in there? It looks like yeah. the worst place you could be. And we were like, it's like standing at the gates of hell going, Beatum up, Beatum up, I'm over here. I'm in, oh, I can't see me. Oh, I've got to get in, i got to get in. I'm on the door, I'm on we the door. We went to Eton together. <laughs> Last time I was on this stage, mm. not as in before the break, yeah. um, <laughs> was when I was 22 and I was doing the final of the Funny Women competition, Ooh. sponsored by Benefit Cosmetics. And there was a big glittery sign here that said, laughter is the best cosmetic. And I tried to get the sign for you, Deb. Um, but they wouldn't surrender it. Oh, that's... But it's such a good message, isn't it? It's... A, it's... <laughs> Mm, it's really strong (laughs) and it's true I can't say anything now because I take advertising now which I said I would never 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 do and then two years of pandemic later where I could not sell a single ticket to a single show it was that or kill the podcast and uh, live on the street so because because the podcast has taken up sponsored by Benefit Cosmetics no but the podcast the podcast has taken up so much of my living like I used to earn a good living then I started a podcast and then the podcast became bigger and bigger and so I had to phase out other things to do it so then I'm left with a podcast which I only sell tickets for I always like no advertising what's it called? (laughs) I mean I'm so sorry. It's called <laughs> Laughter is the Best Cosmetic now. Oh, <laughs> it, we've got ourselves a new called the Guilty Feminist, but it's now called Laughter is the Best cosmetic, best cosmetic. And I'm proud to have Benefit sponsor every episode but for the next year. This is my lack of authority, is that we all, they all insisted upon giving us a makeover for the final. Stop and it. I was, because I was 22, no. I didn't know how to say no. So I was up here looking like a full drag queen. Oh. There's a video on YouTube. I have long hair. Oh, I'm definitely going to watch that right now. Unrecognisable. <laughs> Everyone get out their phones. Yeah. We're all going to watch it together. And so I'm having sort of trauma flashbacks to the Funny Women final. Oh, I'm so sorry. But look... I came second. <laughs> <laughs> you are... Who came first? Desiree Birch. Oh, well, fair enough. Can't argue with that, no. can you? Yeah, but that's a good first and second. You know, yeah. you're now both massively big hitters. I'm delighted by that story and I am definitely going to watch that video a few times Mm -hmm. already in advance. I'm very excited by that. I look horrendous. Did you feel... Seriously, though? No. (laughs) No. (laughs) And I think you'll know why when you see it. Okay. 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 I'm excited. No, I'm very excited to watch it. But Mm -hmm. I... What would you say now, now that you're not 22, now that you're almost 30, if someone said, we need to give you a makeover before the show, what would you say? Well, now, because I have to have my makeup done for various things, and now I just say, just do what you're doing for the boys. That's my, ah. that's why. But that's not particularly authoritative, is it? It's just, I'm just going, I'll just have what he's having, please. Yeah, yeah no, and I do they see go, that. Really? Because yeah. just a little bit of eyeliner? And I go, no, um, thank you. No, thank you. Is that what they say? Do just a little bit of eyeliner? Yeah. The what? amount of makeup artists that beg to put eyeliner on me. Well, Tim Minchin does eyeliner. You could do eyeliner. That's You could do eyeliner. Yeah, but Tim Minchin does it because he's a cool man, yeah. whereas I would just look like a lady. <laughs> That's the androgyny thing, isn't it? Mm, I see what you mean. he's androgynous and it's cool. If he does it, it's saying, eyeliner. Like, if you do it, it's eyeliner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How does that work? Mm, it's like a man bun. It's just a bun if I have one. <laughs> oh my God, that's true. If yeah. you want to be a hipster with guy liner and a bun, you actually look like you work in HR. It's a, yeah. <laughs> it's oh, damn it. That's actually true. It's that's a nightmare. Disappointing. Mm. You are, 
Women Unlimited again. Doesn't matter which way we turn. Hello, Guilty Feminist. Just very quickly pausing this episode to say the Guilty Feminist live UK tour starts in Brighton and Nottingham on Saturday, the 5th of March and Sunday, the 6th of March. These are going to be big, exciting, lively shows with Guilty Feminist's favourite comedians and special local guests and musicians coming to your town. So get your tickets now. You won't want to miss this. We are also back at Vicar Street in Dublin with Alison Spittle on the 14th of March. Whether you're a gay Michael or not, please come along to that. Get your tickets now. There is a Valentine's special at King's Place on the 14th of February. One episode will be a crossover episode uh, with Homo Sapiens, which is about all things queer. It'll be called The Guilty Homo Sapien. And then the other episode we'll record that night after the interval will be with the wonderful Susan Wacoma. Both of those will be an alternative to your Valentine's Day. So whether you're single or looking for a date, it's going to be a Guilty Feminist Valentine's special you won't want to miss. We will be touring Australia and New Zealand in July. And we are coming to Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Canberra, Adelaide and Perth. We're also coming to Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch. And finally, if you had tickets for Campers Christmas, it's now called Campers Springtime uh, because COVID cancelled Christmas. Uh, your ticket is still valid and it's on March the 31st, still co-hosted by me and Tom Allen, still featuring self-esteem and an incredible lineup of comedians. So to hold on to those tickets, put March 31st in your diary. If you haven't got a ticket, there are still some left, but not many. So get them now. You can get tickets for all of these shows that I've just talked about at guiltyfeminist.com. And you can get ad-free episodes of The Guilty Feminist by supporting us on Patreon. And now back to the podcast. Please welcome to the stage the incredible Sarah K. Watts. Hello, 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 hello. Uh, um, I uh, use social media. Uh, have you heard of it? Uh, I use Instagram, um, and I went, I went through uh, a breakup in 2020. Uh, not a particularly. Uh, I was I was dating another comedian, and it was, it was kind of only interesting to a very a very specific brand of uh, intense person on Instagram. Uh, specifically, one man uh, over the weeks of, after my breakup messaged me every single day, uh, just saying, uh, "Where is she?" every single day and this was during lockdown in 2020 and I got sort of over as the course of several weeks of this happening I got more and more confused and I panicked and I thought I have to respond because what if he thinks I've killed her <laughs> so I wrote back to this man this very very concerned man uh, and I said um, hello uh, thanks for your interest um uh, everybody's fine. Uh, we've just broken up. Uh, everyone is okay and well. Um, uh, hope, hope you are too. <laughs> uh, uh, this guy uh, responded saying, uh, uh, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. Uh, I hope that you're okay. I hope that she's okay. Uh, just want to wish you all the best uh, and best of luck with everything in the future. And I thought, gosh, that's nice. That's really lovely, isn't it? And then I felt bad. I sort of felt guilty for rejecting uh, his interest and his kindness because I thought, Do you know what? I am lucky that I have people online who care about me and my well-being. Gosh, why aren't I grateful for that? And in the sort of nine seconds that it took me to process all of that, he had sent me a full picture of his dick and balls. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm new to this. Uh, to this sort, of, this sort of thing. Is it traditional to include the balls? <laughs> Is that the... Because I've heard about... I know that they're called dick pics. They're not called dick and ball pics. <laughs> Is that... I, I, I don't know. Is it a done thing? I've got no idea. I've sort of, my best reading of it is that he's being kind. 
uh, and he knows that I'm gay on the off chance that I sort of randomly turn around and take him up on the offer and I turn up on the day and he whaps it all out and then all of a sudden I'm like hold on a minute what are they <laughs> they were not in the reference photo those were not as advertised did you add them later on um I'm incredibly shocked, so perhaps he's just being... In hindsight, I think I was being daft, really, wasn't I? Assuming that the people who are sending dick pics are pinning their balls back <laughs> out of shot. Uh, so it's interesting. It's like, I, love, I love that, though. I love that confidence. There's no bit of my body that I'd be confident enough to just... To, what is it about these people who, who look down at their own genitalia and go, yeah, that... That needs a photo shoot. <laughs> that is absolutely fascinating, isn't it? I can't believe it. I've taken to closing my eyes when I wank, so I couldn't do it at all. I love talking about, I'm start talking about wanking on stage because I think it's fun. Because I don't feel, I feel like it's slightly, to, female masturbation is taboo, isn't it? It's more taboo than, than male masturbation, I think. Men wanking's everywhere. It's all over TV, and men talk about wanking on stage all the time. I think female masturbation is relatively taboo. It's getting better, but I think it's quite taboo. Having said that, we've done a cracking PR job on it, haven't we? <laughs> we have. I'm going to explain, right? Because here's the thing. I don't know about you, but when I think about a woman wanking, right, it's always, it's like early evening... Like, she's got some, like, candles burning. <laughs> she's got nice white sheets. Uh, maybe she's eating a yoghurt or something like that. It's quite, it's quite sophisticated. It's quite classy. There's something quite nice about it. Whereas, I don't know about you, but when I think about a man wanking, it's always, it's always at night. And it's always in a park. Um... <laughs> And I'm not saying that's fair. I'm not saying it's fair at all. That's, it's not, you know, I know that men have other wanks. And also, you know, but that is, that's a famous one, isn't it? That's one of the big ones. Isn't it? I'm not saying it's fair. This is, I realise how men hating I sound during this. Actually, they're good. Uh, I just think it's classier, isn't it? I just think it's classier, you know. A woman wanking, it's, it's a more sophisticated act. It's like somebody having a very busy day on a laptop trackpad, you know? <laughs> She's getting stuff done. She's clicking on links. She's scrolling. She's scrolling. She's taking her time. She's scrolling. Whereas a man wanking is like a bit of kit at a sausage factory is broken and Alan's got to do 6,000 Cumberlands by hand before 5 p.m. <laughs> yeah. It's a double standard. I'm not saying it's, it's not fair. This is injustice, is what I'm saying. It's not fair. All I'm saying is if a woman came on me on a train, I'd be a little bit impressed. That's what I'm saying. That's feels like being shit on by a bird, doesn't it? It's sort of annoying. You're like frustrated. Oh, I've got to change my shirt now. But also, what are the chances? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, okay with everybody. Please put your hands together for Deborah Francis White. <laughs> So, as you know, I write mine bespoke because it has to be new every time. So, I'll be reading it. So, I don't want any judgment. <laughs> and I have my full authority on here. It's my authority. Okay. I'm going to do an authority pose. Maybe a little bit forward. Yeah. Okay. Right. Authority. Men have it. Women don't. Yada, yada, yada. We've all been brainwashed to see men as authoritative human beings. And, you know, I've obviously been brainwashed uh, because I just watched our male prime minister, a man who had a baby grow, which said the right honourable infant from pissing on the world. A man who had so many silver spoons in his mouth he couldn't fit in his wet nurse's tit. <laughs> Stand up in front of the whole country and say... You know those lies I definitely told about there being no parties? And then the ones about there being parties, but me deliberately not being informed. Definitely not being informed. And then the ones about me being involved, but me definitely not understanding the rules that I myself told you plainly to your faces from the dispatch box. Well, now the findings of Sue Gray's long-awaited report say that 12 of those parties need to be criminally investigated by the actual police, and I still feel I have the authority to run this country. What I'm saying to you is, 
Either I, I couldn't run a piss up in a brewery, or I did in fact run a piss up in a brewery, but didn't realise I was at a piss up in a brewery. <laughs> And when MP after MP, even those from his own party, even former Tory PM, Theresa May, said, but you lied, or words to that effect that they were actually allowed to use, because apparently in British Parliament, you're not allowed to say you lied. You have to say you accidentally didn't tell the truth. Otherwise, <laughs> you get sent out, even though when it is absolutely clear somebody has lied. He seemed to hold his authority as if it didn't matter. As far as I can make out, every question that was asked in Prime Minister's Questions today was, did you order the code red? Every question, did you order the code red? Did you order the code red? And every answer was, I'm very grateful to the right honourable member for bringing the code red to my attention. And as I said, we now need to wait for the police findings on whether I inadvertently ordered the code red or whether we need a private secretary to make sure no more code reds are ordered. And the current code reds are a matter for Sue Grace Fuller report, which she will release, but I have no intention of publishing after the police findings. And I have, of course, instructed Cressida Dick to find as little as possible. So the main thing is we now wait on inadvertent findings. And I'd hope the right honourable member would wait on those findings with me. Anyone fancy a rosé? If so, pop round to number 10 tonight for a cheeky glass and a sing-along to Knees Up Mother Brown, Rural Britannia. <laughs> Authority is all about holding your nerve. What a female pilot comes on the microphone on a plane and says, hello passengers, it's Captain Jane Sylvester here. She knows there are jokes on that plane. She knows, she knows that passengers are sniggering away, going, I oh, hope she doesn't have a period. Oh, I wonder if she'll be able to park it. You're hilarious, Alan, on your way to Magaluz, you who failed GCSE maths and his driving test three times, telling Captain Jane Sylvester she may not be able to park it. Why don't you park it, Alan, going to Magaluz? Why don't you park it up your ass? <laughs> There was a time when female doctors had no authority in this country. Uh, and they were, uh, women were told they were absolutely unsuited for the profession. They were going to faint at the sight of blood. They didn't understand how the inside of bodies worked. They would have no bedside manner. And then Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, she uh, showed them by doing some, you know, jumping through some sort of, I suppose, you know, cursory hoops, like uh, finding a, uh, a medical school that had forgotten to say no women allowed, the only one in the country. And it was only the really reason they'd forgotten to say no women allowed is they thought it was just so perfectly obvious. It was like saying no zebras allowed. Um, and so she got in there on a technicality, but then they still wouldn't let her practice. So she learned French well enough to go to France, to go to Sorbonne, where they were letting women in. And she came back from France. They said, yes, you are qualified now, but no one would hire her. So then she said, all right, I'll start my own surgery, but no one would come, no men, no women. And so then, uh, there, luckily for her, there was a fantastic uh, piece of luck. There was an outbreak of cholera. And... <laughs> So people were so desperate for doctors, they were like, oh, we'll even give her a go. And then they went, oh, she's quite good, actually. And then she said, right, I'm opening a school for women to become doctors. Um, and uh, that's the difference between a woman who goes, oh, I'm special, I'm the only lady doctor, let's keep it that way, and let's keep all other women out with our sharp elbows, and I'll go down in history as the only lady doctor ever. And instead, she said, let's have more women doctors, so no one will even remember my name. That was 1865. Now, over 50% of doctors in the UK are women, a mere 157 years later. When over half the pilots are women, Captain Jane Sylvester will relax. She will have her authority if robots haven't definitely taken her job. I hope at least it's a female robot who takes her job. And I warn that female robot for at least a very long time, she will be given absolutely no respect. People will be like, oh, robot doctor, but she's got cold hands. A robot, a robot, a pilot, oh, I hope she's wearing a short skirt. Alan will say on the way to Magaluf. And to Al and I say, if our robot prime minister is snorting software in number 10 till the wee hours and getting off with a photocopier, good luck to her. Female robots have waited their turn. Thank you very much. Our guest today is an acclaimed broadcaster and presenter. Based on new original research and interviews with pioneering women, her book, The Authority Gap, brings a fresh perspective. 
on how to address and counteract systemic sexism and provide the essential tools to make it happen. Please welcome Marianne Sighart. There she comes. Hello, hello, hello. I'm a feminist, but I get slightly distracted sometimes by this iPad because there used to be a big screen on the floor where we could see ourselves because this is being live streamed. I should have said hello to the lovely live streamers. I'm, no, I'm now looking at the iPad. They're not there. They're up here. There's cameras. Hello. Oh, hello. I can, I can never really see where the cameras are and I find it unnerving. So there's an iPad now instead of that thing on the floor, which takes ages to install. But the iPad's a little bit behind. So I can see how I looked 30 seconds ago. <laughs> So sometimes, yeah, I can now see myself doing that and then that, but now it's going to happen again. It's in a loop. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, is it going to happen again? Oh, I'm, bef- I'm like a minute behind. Um, we should see what people are saying. We're now taking a 20-minute break. Oh, okay, no. Um, She's just on before. Wordle. Indeed. <laughs> Mary Ann Seekhardt, everybody. Uh, so lovely to meet you. Mary Ann, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, haven't had COVID. Hope I won't catch it, but uh, had my booster. I, well my done. booster got cancelled because I had COVID. Oh, oh God. Yeah, it will be. They won't boost you if you've got COVID. It's and kind then of the main thing that will stop you. Do you know what my ne- why my next booster got COVID? I uh, got co- my <laughs> <laughs> my booster got COVID. It was a really bad day. <laughs> Do you want my next booster got cancelled? Um, too close to COVID. You, they wouldn't. They won't shoot. They won't shoot you up. <laughs> they won't that shoot you up. To, that close to COVID. The same batch of COVID. They just won't. They just say you, COVID has to be fully, fully, you know, in the rearview mirror before they're going to pump more COVID into your arm. Right, okay. Vaccine. You can't have this COVID if, you, if you've had that COVID. Very much. They don't want you having a <laughs> cocktail of COVID. Okay. Yeah, they, they, don't want, they don't want that. Have you had COVID? I, I don't know. Though I did, um, I did a test today. What? And... Um, what, you're waiting on the results? Bad news. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I don't, if I have, I don't know that I have. I've never had a positive test. Uh, but I, I've, I've felt really tired on occasion. <laughs> so that could be it. That could just be nearly 30. Could be life, couldn't it? Could be life, uh, yeah. No, but I have been boosted. Everyone else says that they, when they get jabbed, it's really gentle. And I keep getting the most softly spoken people who will be like right are you ready and i'll be like yeah i'm ready and then they'll go Poof, wow in my arm wow yeah it's really quite aggressive maybe it's something to do with your natural authority maybe they think it's i can take it yeah standing yeah, up to you which, i can't which, which beautifully segues into the authority gap um marianne you uh wrote a book called the authority gap and the subtitle is Why Women Are Still Taken Less Seriously Than Men and What We Can Do About It. Um, the Sunday Times says persuasive, arresting, punchy and incisive. The Guardian says fascinating, thorough and empowering. So could you tell us a little bit about the research you did? Because I think a lot of people now think we are living in something of a meritocracy. Sometimes I hear that argument from women. Uh, they go, well, you know, it sort of evened itself out now. Don't go asking for special favours. Certainly a lot of men go, Luke, if you were good enough, you'd be there by now. That is, it's a common thing that you hear. So although we anecdotally feel it and we see it in matters of representation, what is the evidence that you were able to discover that says that women are not endowed with as much authority? Okay, I'm going to start by telling you about how I had to give a talk on this subject and I thought, well, I better define my terms, okay? So I literally just Googled authority and definition. Very first result came up was the Oxford Online Dictionary. Every single example they used to illustrate different meanings of the word authority began with the same pronoun. I think you can guess which one it was. So we had, he had the natural authority of one who was used to being obeyed. He hit the ball with authority. He was an authority on the stock market. And I thought, now, hang on a minute. Hasn't Margaret Thatcher, didn't she have the natural authority of one who was used to being obeyed? You know, doesn't Serena Williams hit the ball with authority? Um, I mean, that was just an illustration of how we just so much more readily associate male with authority. I wasn't even looking for that. I was just looking for a definition, right? But there is a, a huge amount of academic research showing 
instances of women being undermined, interrupted, having their expertise challenged, underestimated. Uh, for instance, interruptions, okay? So men are much more likely to interrupt women than they are other men. And however authoritative you are as a woman, you're just never insulated from this. So there was this amazing study done of US Supreme Court justices. And you don't get much more authoritative than that, right? And women make up a third of the Supreme Court justices, but they suffer two thirds of all interruptions, 96% of the time by men. So they're four times more likely to be interrupted than their male colleagues. Wow. And then there was another study done. You know that phenomenon, I, I bet everybody here has experienced it, where you make a point in a gathering or at a meeting or something. Nobody takes a blind bit of notice, right? The water's just close up above your head. And 10 minutes later, a guy makes the same point and is treated like the second coming. Okay? Mm -hmm. We've all had that. And so the study was done where they put a group of people together, a mixed sex group of people, and they were supposed to be discussing a child custody case. And they deliberately chose that because it's quite a sort of female stereotype subject, right? And they gave the group all sorts of information about the family concerns. And they gave a few individuals a piece of information that no one else had. And when that information was introduced by a man, it was six times more likely to be used by the group in their deliberations than when it was introduced by a woman. Six times more. That's what we're up against when we're trying to influence a group. I think the most persuasive evidence, actually, of the authority gap is the experience of people who've lived as both, as both a man and a woman. Because if you think about it, normally if you're in a position at work, say, and you've got a male colleague and you're both up for promotion, he gets the job and you don't. And you might think bias was at play. It probably was, right? But it's terribly hard to prove because your manager might just say, well, he was better than you. But if you just correct for all the other variables, which you do when you're talking to somebody who has lived as both a man and a woman, they're exactly the same person. So they've got the same intelligence and ability and experience and so personality. Do you, do you mean someone who's trans, who maybe yes. presented as exactly. a, a woman? Exactly, presented as a woman and, and then, then started living as a man. Transitioned and came out. Exactly. Okay. And these trans men in particular say, ah, oh, I'm just treated with so much more respect now. So there was a, there was a uh, this sounds anecdotal, but it's sort of quite scientific in a way. There were these two Stanford professors, professors of science, who each transitioned in opposite directions at the same time. Ben Barris, who was a neuroscientist, said, I've had the thought a million times. I'm just taken more seriously now. People see me as a man. And someone at the back of one of his seminars who didn't know his history said, oh, Ben Barris gave such a good seminar today, but then his work's so much better than his sister's. Oh. Exactly. So and that person thought that the work that he'd done when he was presenting as a woman was his, his sister's, sister's work. His work, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. And That's meanwhile, incredible. Joan Roughgarden, an evolutionary biologist, transitioned to start living as a woman and came across all this sort of behavior that I write about in The Authority Gap. She found she was patronized and talked over, not listened to. You know, her, her expertise was challenged. People would say to her things like, well, you haven't read the literature. She said, that never happened to me when people thought I was a man. Mm. And she said, to start with, I thought, well, if I'm going to live as a woman, I'm darn well going to be discriminated against like a woman. And then she said, well, the thrill of that's worn off, I can tell you. Mm. And her conclusion is that men are assumed to be competent until proven otherwise, mm -hmm. and women are assumed to be incompetent until they prove otherwise. Mm -hmm. I saw a thing being shared online of a woman saying that she, uh, she was in a meeting with a load of male colleagues, and she said to them, every time one of you interrupts me, I'm going to bang my fist on the table. And they um, took the table off her. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I, it, it's really useful to have the data on it because sometimes you can feel like, is this just me? Do I need to change? Am I seeing something that isn't there? And especially I think when you're, you know, many people will be in jobs where they'll talk to somebody who's managing them and that person will say, what you need to do is, and they're not acknowledging that you're not starting from a standing start. That's not to say if we are at disadvantage, there's not things we can do to push through, but at least we need, we need it to be acknowledged that it's harder. I think that would be fair, and we need to be given some tools and also 
what, what would be really nice is if the men were given training or the management level was given training around it and the part, you know, if there's whoever, you know, wherever you're working, whether you're working in a fast food restaurant or whether you're working in a law firm, I think the management and the partners need to be hearing about this. The people who run the show because then they can do something to make it fairer and they can legislate and say, you know, ha start have procedures so men realise that they're doing it. You also are involved in the Women's Prize for Fiction. What's your role there? I'm chairing the judges this year. And one of the things that we really want to do is to try to get men to read books by women, novels by women in, in, in this instance. Uh, because there's a whole chapter in the book about how if it's not bad enough that men don't accord us equal authority, a lot of the time they're not even listening to us in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're not reading the books that we write. They're not following us on Twitter. If they're not even allowing us into their newsfeed, how are they going to tell if we've got any authority? Mm -hmm. And the statistics show that on average, we women, we're very even-handed, very open-minded, and we'll read roughly 50-50 books written by men, books written by women. For men, on average, the figure is 80-20. So they read four books by a man for every book by a woman. And it's not just that it's unfair to us, which it is, but it's also really stupid for them because they're only seeing half the world. They're getting this incredibly narrow view of the world if they're only reading books by other blokes. Yes, and also they're missing out on some great books. Yeah, but absolutely. I think more fundamentally... We can't change people's worldview if they keep on filtering it through the same experience. And that's why things like Paw Patrol really upset me. Um, <laughs> genuinely. Because the first time I, I, I knew what finally. Paw Patrol was, was it, what was that? Finally. Finally, someone's getting to the finally. real good stuff. <laughs> I genuinely think Paw Patrol is responsible for the next generation of this happening, almost single-handedly. I know I'm obviously being a bit sarcastic, but I'm sort of not. A few years ago at Christmas, there was a family that visited and a little girl I'd never met before. And she came in. She was pre-verbal. She was you know, 18 months or something. And she came up. You know how little kids like to give you their toys and then take them back? Mm -hmm. It's sort of like they're giving you a present. And she came up and she gave us all a Paw Patrol doll and I hadn't seen it before. Now, this was invented in 2018. This was invented in 2018. And I looked it up. I couldn't believe it. They were like... Six or seven, maybe more male characters, and they were all, it was a boy and his dogs, and each dog, one of the dogs had a, he had a fire helmet on, and one of them had a police hat, and... Strippers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the dogs were strippers. <laughs> it was like, or maybe they were in a YMCA dog tribute band. It oh, wasn't clear. Sounds great. Um, and there was one girl dog, and that girl dog was called Sky. and they all had a superpower, and what she had was like a helicopter. She had a pink ribbon in her hair. She was very pink, and her voice was like this. And then she could spin up or something. She had a helicopter. It was unbelievable. And I was looking at it going, this cannot be made now. But it's not just the girls watching this going, oh, in order to be invited on the adventure, I have to talk like this and have a pink ribbon. It's the boys watching that going... There's no need to invite a girl. And if you invite a girl, you should only invite one and she should be pretty yeah. in a very particular and specific conventional way. And I'm like, how will this ever shift? Why, why will boys who play with this, who become prime minister, have a cabinet that looks different from this? This has gone in from pre-verbal. And why will this girl who's handing it to me expect to be invited on the adventure or expect that her place there would be anything except cosmetic and coy? I, it drives me insane. So I really loved that part uh, in your final chapter where you said it's not all despair, which I really, to be honest, I cut to it because I was starting to feel despair. And I was like, there's got to be something good. Oh, this chapter that says don't despair. I was like, go to that one. Um, we can take gendered words out of our job advertisements. Don't ask for competitive, assertive, or ambitious applicants, let alone, and I quote, and this is a real quote, a ninja coder who wrestles problems to the ground. So <laughs> True example. Is that a, a quote? Yep, that's, yep. that's in, in a, a job, job ad. a job ad. A job ad saying we need a ninja coder who wrestles problems to the ground. I've worked for these big tech companies doing diversity and inclusion, and they call them programmers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. go fuck yourselves. Um, <laughs> That's what you could put in the job ad as well. Um, 
so these are other suggestions. Uh, we can state in the job advertisement that salary is negotiable and encourages women to negotiate. But then we mustn't allow our bias to find that woman unlikable if she does. We can use blind CVs and application letters so that hiring managers can't tell if they're from a man or a woman or a non-binary person. In a study which anonymized applications from scientists for time on the Hubble Space Telescope, men outperformed women when their gender was known. After anonymization, women outperformed men. I mean, we also know that a woman applicant is 30% less likely to be called for a job interview than an identically qualified man. We can insist on putting more than one woman on every shortlist. Having only one woman against three men means there is statistically zero chance of her being hired. That is because the ratio is sending the implicit message that a man is more suitable for the job. Adding another woman to the shortlist makes the odds of hiring a woman 79 times greater. Teach, there's a lot of stuff about teacher bias here. This chapter has really inspired me to what else we could do. Can you tell me some others of your favourites from the here's what we can do list? Oh, um... I think it's really important that we change the world around us, actually, mm -hmm. because the world around us is telling us that men are in charge. And so if you look at TV, for instance, there is barely a woman over 50 as a TV presenter unless she's presenting something like Cash in the Attic. Okay, so you've Just got... A fantastic you know, you get... show. <laughs> fantastic show, But it's like show, daytime. I'm sure. She's allowed on the daytime. Exactly. Yeah, to scrub around people's in attic. In the attic. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. But as soon as she's got the slightest wrinkle or grey hair, she is off. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, men can have a face that looks like a relief map of the Alps and they're still allowed on telly, right? <laughs> it's very true. It's very true. Why is yeah. that? Why are men who are not billboard attractive. I would understand if it's just one, and that is a British thing as well, because there, you go to some countries and everyone on the television looks like they've had all of their teeth done and their face is, is so tight, it looks like someone's sitting behind them pulling it back and, you know, they've got, they're very symmetrical and that's across the board. But so, in Britain, the men that are allowed on television... Which I've no problem with that. I just I mean, think in terms can we even look a bit guys? British people really have to just work with what they've got. I mean <laughs> Do you know what though? We're I'm, a bit funky looking. I, I know somebody who has to sell you know when people who sell T V shows, so if you they they might sell a Spanish show to somewhere else or they sell a British they say they always say to them, Please can you cast with better looking people because we can't sell this to Europe? <gasps> that's true oh, no. that's true that's true because ours it, it's that we just we cast in dramas and tv you know soap operas sort of ordinary looking people who might be a tad on the telly pretty side but sometimes not sometimes not and they're like why are you casting these people <laughs> other countries complain it's true <laughs> but you're right when it comes to presenters there is a massive gap i mean sue barker's still allowed on because she's such an expert in tennis and won the french open and she's an incredibly attractive woman, but she's been allowed to age, but Bar only... Is quite high, though, isn't it? You have to win the French Open. Yeah, <laughs> and stay in the job, by the way. She's only got that job because she, she wouldn't I'm get that job I'm doing the French now. Open next year, and I'm really nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, even if you get to the semis, I think you're in with a shout. You reckon? Yeah, you'll be on... I reckon you'll be on Mock the Week if the you get to the semis. Sue. <laughs> <laughs> but Sue Barker wouldn't get that job now. She's only got no. that job because she stayed in it. Mm. Yeah. And men are allowed to age on screen and women just aren't. Mm. So particularly in sort of serious things like news and current affairs, hardly any... I think there's Kirsty Walk and that's about it. There's a hard yeah. out. Kirsty, if you're listening, we love you and you don't look old. Um, <laughs> I would, she's I only would... about 60. I mean, she's not old. No, no. Um, and she's an expert. And again, if mm. you're an expert and you've stayed in the job, if you, ref if you just grip on with both hands and refuse to leave when they try and get you out of the building... That can work. Um, <laughs> you find? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try it. So I, I have experience with this sort of thing because I don't necessarily identify as female. I often get confused for being male. And therefore, I will often get sort of deferred to... If I'm out with my girlfriend who presents you know, stereotypically f feminine in that she has long hair and she wears makeup, but apparently that's feminine... Uh, <laughs> People will defer to me, so if we're out for a meal, they'll hand me the bill, mm. or they, they, they'll talk to me, or like they'll give me a, a, the beer if I order a beer, which is yeah. good because she's celiac, so that's fine. But um, <laughs> it's actually Tom, I'm really respectful. But um, Tom orders Diet Coke a lot, mm. and if so, if I order a beer or any alcoholic beverage, they will absolutely always assume that I'm ordering the Diet Coke. And he's ordering. But you couldn't yeah. possibly manage a beer, Deborah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can. I can put back a beer, and I can sit and watch my husband drink a diet coke like a great big girl. Yeah, <laughs> and that's feminism. <laughs> 
I don't know what feminism same, is anymore. I've lost the plot. The, the, the same happens with race. So I talked to the fabulous Bernadine Evaristo. You know, she's a Booker Prize winning novelist. She's a professor of creative writing and she's black. And she said she was giving a tutorial to a young white female student aged about 21. And they decided to go out to a cafe to do it. And the waitress both asked the young girl for the order and gave her the bill at the end. That is astonishing, isn't wow. it? Wow. That's yeah. horrifying. Yeah. Absolutely horrifying. Did she pay? <laughs> now, that would have sorted it, wouldn't it? Um, I am very intrigued by what we can do. And I loved this stuff for teachers because it says here one study found seven out of ten male teachers attributing boys' success in technology to talent while dismissing girls' success as due to luck or diligence. Teachers' bias in favour of boys and against girls in early years of schooling has been shown to hold back girls' careers well into adulthood. Um, teachers can question their ability to judge intelligence. Study after study shows that adults, both teachers and parents, underestimate the intelligence of girls. Parents too. Teachers also find it harder to identify gifted girls than boys. This may be because gifted girls are more likely to try to hide their ability as they know that boys don't like girls being cleverer than them. Oh, God, mm. this is very sad. Isn't it depressing? Um, but I think that's shifting. I really feel that in this generation of children. I don't think that, I, that doesn't reflect, I mean, maybe I'm in a bubble, but I, I see a lot of girls who are like, and non-binary teens as well. Um, teachers can examine textbooks for bias. Oh, this was an interesting one. In a girl guiding survey, 81% of female respondents aged 11 to 21 had witnessed or experienced some sort of sexism in the previous week mainly from boys their own age. 81% of girls, girl guides 11 to 21, had experienced it in the last week. So there's some really interesting stuff, I think, in this chapter especially, that says this is what we can do about it. If people are wondering what they can do if they've got a job interview next Thursday and the world is not going to change and they feel that they're not endowed with enough authority, what can women and and people of minority genders do to assert a sort of authority that's accepted in spaces where they need to be accepted because of feminism or employment or any other reason. Yeah, I, mean, I, I talk a lot about confidence and assertiveness in the book because, you know, the classic thing is to say, oh, uh, just go off on an assertiveness training course and you'll be fine. <laughs> It's not that simple, because if we women start to behave as assertively and as confidently as our male colleagues, people don't like it, and they start using horrible adjectives about us, like, oh, she's very abrasive, or she's strident, or aggressive, or overbearing, bossy, bitchy, ball-breaking, scary, are, controlling, you've heard all those. Those are right? negatives. <laughs> it sounds very sexy. <laughs> 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 um, but these are adjectives that are never used in men doing the same thing, right? Yeah. So the awful thing is we have to be so much more careful. And if, we're, if we're underconfident, if we're not confident enough, we're not taken seriously. If we are confident enough, we're often disliked. Mm -hmm. So then we have to be quite often inauthentic and just sort of layer loads of warmth onto our personality and smile a lot and crack jokes and sort of read the emotional temperature of the room in order to sort of navigate our way through this. And it's really unfair that we have to, and I wish we didn't have to, but, that's, but that, the research shows that's the most successful tactic. Yeah, I think exactly that women are socially conditioned, and actually I would say human beings tend to fall between low status and lovely or high status and cold. Very few people are low status and cold. Hmm. If they're low status, they tend to be lovely. If you're low status and cold, you look like someone that no one would approach and often it's somehow there's a projection of dysfunctionality there you're dead <laughs> if you're if you're if you're high status and a little bit cold then that's absolutely normal that's absolutely you'll you'll know people like that and if you're low status you tend to be warm but high status and warm that's where you're getting into that you know how the obamas are mm. you know that mm, yeah. really powerful but really warm and charming and probably people that you really admire or if you're a fan of somebody, often, you know, somebody like Beyonce, you'll see her being like that. Most, honestly, most celebrities on a chat show, you'll see it. And so it is a very successful strategy. This is not to say that women and people of minority genders have to be all the time being high status and very warm and very delightful. 
but it's a tool for your kid. It's a useful strategy when you need it. If you want to get something and you see that other people who are less qualified than you are getting it and you think, well, I want to get it, and the world is not going to change around you in the next two weeks, while we're working on the structural stuff, I think as an individual, using that as a strategy can be very helpful. There's a but comedian who I won't name who her tactic is to laugh all the time. And she says it makes people warm to her more. It really? likes it. And she just laughs. I couldn't do it. I'd look insane. <laughs> 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 I can't do it. I can't do it. it. Like, no. she could pull it off in a really fantastic way, but I'd, I'd look like a maniac. But that's exactly... <laughs> that's, that's interesting, because that's, that's, she's found a thing that works for her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you do have to find a thing that works for you. And, but play around. Don't be frightened to play around. You're just collecting data. Like, don't play around on a job interview. Like, play around. Go in and before the job interview, order a cup of coffee and see if you can make friends with the waiter or, you know, like, do something that's charming but also keep your status really high and play around with it. I think it's really worth doing because as a feminist, you want tools in your armory. Yeah, you and, you know, we need limited. to get more women into positions of authority so that we no longer have to act like this. Once it becomes normalised, it won't be such a problem. But we've got to get there. Mm. And, yeah, and the I'm, rules I'm, are being made by men, in effect. I'm, just... all, I'm all for pragmatic short-term solutions while we're working on the mid- and long-term solutions of structural change. I'm not somebody who goes, we shouldn't have to, therefore I'm not. I'm like, well, shouldn't have to, but if I do have to, and that's going to get me a better result, then absolutely while I'm waiting for the feminist genie yeah. you know, to come down and grant me three wishes, I'm happy to pragmatically do what I need to do to get where I need to go. So thank you very much for writing this book. Is there anything else you want to tell us about it or any tidbits in it that you think, oh, I didn't get to say that? I think the most depressing, the most depressing <laughs> statistic I came you across. Don't, don't leave in. us on this. If you've got a depressing one, you're going to have to have a happy one. You can't leave oh, on the most depressing. Go on, go okay. on, give us the most depressing one. Okay, it was that if you ask British parents to estimate their children's IQ, they will estimate their sons on average at 115 and their daughters at only 107. Even though girls do better at school, they develop faster, they have a bigger vocabulary. And so it's no surprise that if you ask adult men to estimate their IQ, they estimate it on average at 110 and adult women do at 105, even though we all know that I, the IQ distribution is identical across the genders. It's really depressing, <sighs> no, that is depressing sorry, isn't it? Yeah. Sorry to end on that note. <laughs> I, I, might, I might estimate mine as like 150 now, just to yeah. make up for it. Yeah, to make you pretty up. well should. Can, all I, of us. can I ask your advice on something? Yeah. Because I, I think I'm low status and cold. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I've been told you I've laugh. been told that I uh, can be intimidating because I, I think I can, some, I can go a bit deadpan and I have had situations where I've asserted myself and then people have gone oh that was a bit oh god like why have you, why have you done that and, and recently I sort of put my foot I was hosting a gig and the act that was supposed to be on last it was a horrible christmas gig and I, somebody had already come onto the stage and sort of grabbed me and the act that was on last hadn't arrived yet and they said to me oh would you just go on stage and just fill until he gets here and we we weren't late we weren't running out of time and i just went no i'm not going to do that because i don't want to go back up there and stand up there for however long it's not, it's not my fault that the next act's late it's not my responsibility for him to be on time I, you know, I would do that on a different occasion but this audience is so difficult I'm not going to do that and then one of the other acts went wow you know that was really god you I would never say that to them. I can't believe you said that to them and then I walked away thinking god have I done the wrong thing what's the right thing if somebody makes you feel awkward for having done something what's the right way to go no, I was just standing up for myself. I mean, it's brilliant that you did stand up for yourself. But I really <laughs> fucked but, off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why just, should you? You don't applaud me. I was just really grumpy and I was tired and it was like the 18th of so, December and I was like, fuck you all. <laughs> but also, you'd done your piece. There was no need and mm. it was an awful audience. Christmas gigs are very traditionally very difficult unless they're guilty feminist ones. Yeah. So, no, it's true. Guilty feminist Christmas gigs are incredible. But it is a hard time of year to entertain anybody because people are out with their mates drinking and don't really want to listen. But the thing that Why gets me is, is, that, is that next bit where people go, oh, gosh, all right, look mm. at you. 
And then I but go, oh my God, I look at me. I think that's I, I think an that, admiration and jealousy a little bit. I yeah, think but they're it, going, I wish I had the guards. But I think they're also surprised because we are so socialized as women to be people pleasers. Mm. And so we often find it hard to say no. And they were probably really surprised that you did. It's brilliant that you did. But they were surprised because they expected you just to help out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, you, no, but I think it was legendary behavior. Mm. You did something absolutely amazing. And I think that person is more likely next time to go, oh, no, I won't be doing that. But I'm sure you didn't go, no. I did. I just walk away. Oh, I, did. <laughs> I did. No. Yeah. I don't know. No, I didn't do that. I explained myself. Yeah. But, but it's, uh, it's there's hard. no reason why you should. But I think that uh, Marianne is right that, uh, that the expectation is that women and non binary people are going to be amenable. And you weren't instantly amenable. And that other person was surprised. Was that person, uh, can I ask the gender of that person? I think you know. <laughs> was it a man? It was a man. Yeah, that man yes. was surprised to see you do that. He wouldn't have been surprised to see a male comic do that. Yeah, that's what I thought. Mm. Yeah. I was like, a man would just go, no. No, no, I'm not doing it. Yeah, no. absolutely. Probably wouldn't even explain themselves. No. There were so know, many male ask comics. A man. They were like, oh, Keyworth will do it. Keyworth does anything. <laughs> well, they were wrong. It's a new era. Did I? I feel now I might have got so excited to answer that. Did you answer? Did you get to answer that? What a lovely short? example of everything we've been talking about. Oh no! <laughs> I, At least you weren't a man interrupting me. So I'll forgive you. Yes. Did Actually, I? You're the host, anyway. No, no. Did I interrupt you? Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Tell her. I'm so sorry. <laughs> if someone interrupts you. Is there a assertive but not rude way of being like, you've just interrupted me? It's a really difficult one. And actually, the best thing is to recruit an ally who can say, oh, hang on a minute. I was really interested in what Sarah was saying there. Oh. That works much better. People are really interested in what um, I'm saying. <laughs> I have to get my dad or something. <laughs> um, I, I do sometimes say plaintively, please let me finish. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, Marianne Seagat, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank Wonderful. you so much. I'm sure everyone's going to go and get your book, The Authority Gap. Marianne Seagat, everybody. <laughs> so sing us out. Please welcome to the stage, Nadia Javid. <laughs> everyone um all right hello so we're gonna play a couple of songs uh this is harriet by the way hello thank you. two-thirds of the tuts does anyone know the tuts in here the band called tuts oh, thank you yes we have a fan that's thank good enough much. for me one uh we're gonna play you a song and uh this song i sort of i think back at school white boys never fancied me um i think it's because they were racist but <laughs> as i grew up and I started to like wear eyeliner and I got my eyebrows done, blah, blah, blah. Uh, a white boy fancied me. And I was like, wow, a white boy fancies me. And then he became my boyfriend. And I soon realized it was pretty overrated. Um, <laughs> but I wrote this song about him. And uh, I mean, I probably should have broken up with him a long time ago. I mean, I'm Muslim. And I had to sit with his family at Christmas while they're all crunching on pork crackling. <laughs> but he looked bloody tasty. Um, it was all crunchy and stuff. But anyway, so there's a, there's a little... We're going to say something, and then you have to shout, dump your boyfriend. Okay. So we're going to say, if you've got a shit boyfriend... Dump your boyfriend. Yeah, again, but less shit. <laughs> and all together, please. Yeah, all together. <laughs> all, all together. I know you're tired. We should all be in bed. What's going on? My eyes are half open. Anyway. <laughs> If you've got a shit boyfriend, they all tell me to die. Da da da, my boyfriend, but I can't just die. Accusations for what about all the birds in your tree? So pull off their plaster for me. It, it is my safety blanket, you know. Can't live with it, you know. Can't live without it, oh. Without it, hollow without 
And then I met somebody else, and he was actually really lovely and made me feel really secure. And um, but of course, I sabotage everything that makes me feel happy. Um, but there was one problem that it was weird. Um, it's weird. He kind of became like my dad, and so I didn't really find him sexually attractive anymore. But we had this amazing sort of companionship. But then his family started putting pressure on us to get married, and then I got a bit freaked out. Um, and he was also Muslim, so they wanted us to get uh, a nikah, which is like a Islamic marriage. And uh, yeah, so basically, I wrote this song about him. Um, but now we're like sing- we're in- we're single, and we're in our thirties, and I'm starting to think, fuck, why did I dump that white boy? Why did I not marry my ex? What's wrong with me? You said you want to marry me, but you never even asked. Your mum and sister cornered me when you went to have a bath. Get a nicker, make it halal. But I don't really want to end up just like my mum and dad, because they got divorced. I'm at your sister's wedding, and I feel out of place. Everybody's here with a miserable face Oh, what a waste of money Your homophobic cousins aren't funny And I don't really want to end up just like my mum and dad And I This weird dynamic where I'm the baby and you're the missing piece, the dad who walked out on me. We got a lot of love, but we don't make love. I don't really want to end up just like my mom and dad, because they got married young when my mum was 19 and sacrificed their youth to raise a family tree. And I'm so privileged. I'm living my ancestors' dreams And I don't really want to end up just like My mum and dad and I can't marry you I can't marry you It's not in my truth And I can't admit, I can't commit But you're forcing me away You're forcing me to say
The recording engineer was Burundi Lizimbra. Music was Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Polinski for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Zoe, Sally, and everyone at King's Place, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyperminence.com. I haven't read all of it, but I've, I've just, just to let you know, I won't say that on the podcast. Um, so, um, I just, if you say a bit and I think, oh, I, that, I don't want to have to fake it. Um, it's just a feminist principle. Don't fake anything. Um, seriously though, what I've read, I've really enjoyed. So The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.